Make sure family. Good morning, Mohan sir, Jacob sir, Pavel sir, <coughs> Patman Kumar sir, all colleagues, friends. So today we will be having a breakfast semi by the Department of Orthopedics. Orthopedics update. So we will be having three speakers. Dr. Josh Thomas Papanacheri, Dr. George Jacob and Dr. Appu Bini. And the chairpersons will be Jacob Ali sir and Lassa Chandi sir. So we request the chairpersons and uh, speakers to please come on stage and start the proceedings. Thank you. Yes sir. Good morning everybody. Uh, greetings from Orthopedics. I think uh, we have three talks uh, of what essentially we are telling about what, what we do in our department and what we have something different from the departments in town. We have Joe's Kickstart, uh, who's the uh, maestro as far as pelvic establishment in, in South probably, and he's also the president of the Indian Pelvic Establishment Surgeons Group. And, uh, and there's something in establishments that when we all train, we said we need to do at least 50 to be good at it. And Joe's is probably an example of that because everybody's having a go and we're having bad results around. So I think it's an example to show basically how accomplished you can and how good the results you can. Thanks, Joe's. Please take. Respected chairpersons, senior colleagues, and friends. When the pelvic fracture occurs in association with the soft tissue injury in the region of the pelvis, we call it a complex pelvic fracture. This soft tissue injury can be injury to the vessels, the, the venous plexuses, or the bladder, the bowel, the urethra, or the neurological structures. Sometimes it can be a wound making the fracture an open fracture, and rarely you get a subcutaneous degloving, a closed degloving of the skin, what we call moral lavalier lesion. <laughs> Complex pelvic fractures have a high rate of mortality and therefore they are referred to as the pole bearer of the messenger of death. The patient dies in the acute phase from bleeding and after a few days the patient dies from sepsis and multi organ failure. The displacement of the fracture is an indication of the associated soft tissue injury. If you have a badly displaced pelvic fracture, you can assume that there is risk of bleeding, hemorrhage and shock, and uh, soft tissue disruption and uh, chance of infection. The main bleeding in the pelvic fractures is from the fracture site and the venous plexuses. But in about 10 to 15 percent of cases, you have arterial bleeding. A pelvic binder, which is already collected in the retroperitoneum, pressing on the venous plexuses, thus stopping the bleeding. The same thing can be done by the use of an external fixator, which will reduce the pelvic volume, reduce the fracture, and prevent movements of the fracture fragments, thus causing dominant and reduction in the bleeding. An external fixator is indicated when you have an unstable fracture with the patient in hypotension or shock and also a patient with the unstable fracture needs to go to theatre for a laparotomy. It is wise to stabilize that pelvis with an external fixator before the laparotomy is done. The other form of external fixator is a C-clump which stabilizes the posterior part of the pelvic and the sacroiliac joint. It also reduces the pelvic volume, effecting a turbinate effect. The pelvic banking is a good method to apply direct pressure on the bleeding veins, thus stopping the bleeding. The bags should be applied to the presacral and paravesacral areas, thus directly compressing the venous plexus of which are bleeding and stopping the bleeding. If the bleeding continues unabated, even after pelvic packing, you must suspect arterial bleeding 
and an angiography can demonstrate that, and if you can find the bleeding vessel, that the bleeding can be stopped by embolization. So when you combine embolization with belly packing, you can tackle both the venous and arterial bleeding in the retroperitoneal area. Then there is the close degloving injuries, what's called moral lavalier lesion. This was described by uh, this surgeon, uh, a French surgeon called Moral Lavalier. It's a close degloving injury caused by a violent tangential force applied on the skin. The vessels traversing the deep fascia are ruptured, creating the pasteurization of the overlying skin and collection of blood, a hematoma, a closed hematoma in the subcutaneous plane. The important thing about the moral lavalier lesion is in 50% of cases, the hematoma is colonized by bacteria even when it is closed. So, doing a surgery, making an incision through that area and putting an implant is a recipe for disaster. So, if you have a moral lavalier lesion in the pelvis, you must tackle that first, either by an open drainage or by percutaneous drainage before embarking upon open reduction and general fixation of the fracture. When there is blood at the external urethral meatus and the prostate is highlighting suspect urethral rupture. But there is, if there is gross hematuria, that usually indicates a bladder rupture rather than urethral injury. When you suspect a urethral injury, you must get the help of a urologist who can do a retrograde urethrogram before the catheter is inserted. If you insert a catheter with the patient having a partial urethral injury, you can easily convert that into a complete urethral rupture. The pelvic fracture can compress and entrap the sacral nerves and stretch or avails the ventral roots. If you reduce these fractures and stabilize them early, the, you can reduce the stretching of the nerves and help healing or recovery of these nerves. The open pelvic fractures have a direct communication with the outside world. This may be through the skin of the abdomen, thigh, scrotum, buttock or the back, or through the mucosa of the rectum or vagina. The other sets of very high velocity injuries, usually the pedestrians and motorcycle riders are the victims of other victims. Luckily, the open pelvic fractures are rare. They form only 3% of all pelvic fractures, but they have mortality up to 50%. High rate of infection, and at the time of admission to ER, more than half of them are in shock. Historically, the open pelvic fractures had a dismal uh, uh, result, outcome. Uh, if you look at the history, William the Conqueror, was king of England, fell off a horse in the battlefield in 1087, sustained an open pelvic fracture, and he died five weeks later of septicemia. The associated injuries, along with the pelvic fractures, have a great influence on the outcome and in the result of the rate of death after pelvic fractures, as the number of associated injuries goes up the death rate also goes up, as you can see in this uh, diagram. A big laceration at the time in the pelvic area, pelvic, uh, perineal area at the time of accident may appear as a small wound in the ear because it gets contracted. So you must look at this possibility so that you don't underestimate or underdiagnose the wounds in the perineal area so they can be it must have been a big wound, big laceration at the time of accident, so you must take good care of such such wounds. The wounds in the pelvis, along with the fractures, have been classified into three zones. The zone one is the important one because the risk of contamination is highest there. The zone one includes <coughs> wounds in the perineal, perirectal, and posterior sacral areas. The zone one injuries and all rectal wounds must have a colostomy done early and also a distressed segment washed out to prevent fecal contamination of the 
open belly flexion. An example here, 22 year old male, victim of body trauma, causing a vertically unstable pelvic injury and a sacral fracture. He had a rectal injury, so colostomy was done. So that uh, actually contraindicates an anterior approach to the pelvis. Therefore, the SI joint was approached with posterior incision and stabilized with the two perfect density introduced earlier sacral screws. The open belly fractures took a very aggressive management, and Tim Polomen uh, from Hanover has shown that if you adopt the policy of aggressive management of these cases, you can reduce the mortality by half, so from 46% to 25% reduction of mortality when your approach is very aggressive. So that's the lesson. That's the lesson he has taught us. Tim Polomen is one of the big names in well, there's a tabular fatal surgery in the world at present. In India, many in, in the olden times, pelvis and tabular fractures were either neglected or treated in a very, very bad way, very inadequate way. We formed the Association of Pelvis and Tabular Surgeons, AOPS, in the year 2003 with the idea of training the young orthopedic surgeons in the art and science of pelvis and tabular fracture surgery. We utilize the services of not only the national faculty but overseas faculty also to impart training to the youngsters. I'm happy to say that at present in our country almost every big city has someone, somebody who is trained to deal with the pelvis and tabular fracture. That's a big difference, big improvement from what was um, situated in our country 30 years back. I would leave you with the images of this traumatic hemipelvectomy where the limb was surveyed through the sacroiliac joint. By adopting a very active, aggressive philosophy, he could save his life. So he was left with only one half the pelvis, but still he was alive and after a few months he could go back to his job rather than becoming a beggar and uh, dependent on the society for his livelihood. To managing such a case, such a injury, is a Korean task that requires the close cooperation and coordination between a number of specialties, the emergency physician, orthopedic surgeon, plastic surgeon, urologist, and the gastro surgeon. The reward for such a concerted effort is the sight of your patient springing back to life after such a devastating injury like a phoenix which rises from its ashes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, sir. Any questions or comments? While waiting, can I just ask you what do you think has changed over the last five years in uh, uh, first of all, uh, the recognition of the injury has improved and also doing more and more fixation by percutaneous limited incision approaches and also fixation, internal fixation in the emergency situation as part of presentation, as part of treatment of shock. Earlier we are using um, binders, external fixator. Now we are brave enough to take that patient to a bleeding patient to theater and do a percutaneous fixation of the sacroiliac joint which will close the pelvis, stabilize it and bleeding is controlled. So that's the difference which is uh, going, is coming uh, in the last maybe five to ten years. And are you seeing an increase in numbers now with uh, the sort of fractures open? In the increase in number of patients coming to the theater live, alive, because the pre-hospital care is getting better, better ambulance service, better uh, pickup of these patients from the road and they don't die at the site, they don't die in the ambulance, they come to hospital. That's why we are seeing more and more of these patients. I think the number of cases may be same, uh, but uh, the patients who come to hospital alive is definitely more because yeah, I think the credit goes to the pre-hospital uh, care.
Anything you think we need to improve here? You can talk to our chief. In, in, <laughs> do you need anything else for improving survival? Or we get enough uh, support from the facility? No, I mean, do you lose your radiology? Yeah, we, we have uh, yeah, good, good rapport with the, with the other specialties. I think that's not an issue, but the um, only thing is uh, this particular trauma, when you have a definite trauma, I think everybody should realize that it's a life threatening uh, thing, you know, open pelvic trauma. The death rate is up to, up to 50 percent. Of course, you can bring it down to 20 percent by your aggressive management. So, that maybe that awareness may be lacking to some extent, but uh, otherwise, there is there's good support, uh, good support uh, from all other specialties. Thank you. Thanks, Jos. Thank you. We won't delay any further. Next, we have George uh, talking to us about uh, John Persuasion's meniscus and cartilage uh, injury. An update. I'm going to be talking about something very elective, slow, and decisive. Um, there's nothing in emer there's nothing emergent about this except for the fact that you're probably going to suffer ten years later. So. We in orthopedics, um, we are entirely a surgical specialty. We don't have a physician counterpart. We don't have someone who can actually treat the organs of the knee uh, medically. Uh, I think we're kind of at a loss because of that. And um, in that sense, we've basically been searching for the holy grail because we only have an option of replacing, repairing, transplanting. We don't have an option of sustaining something with some medications. So this is just a quick um, slide to show you that you know we've been chasing this dream for the last 40 years and I'm not sure if you're aware but we are the first department uh, not us but we are the first department in the world who was able to take one cell and culture passage it and implant it into a patient and we've been doing that for the last 40 years in a procedure called autologous chondrocyte implantation so as you can see cartilage is a very very complex structure and Earlier on, we were just focusing on the actual cartilage part of it, but now I think it's very important to understand that cartilage comes in a unit, and right below it comes the bone, which feeds the cartilage. So we should be actually talking about chondro-osseous units, uh, and we've seen results with certain surgeries being better when you incorporate bone with the cartilage. So just some of the risk factors that we usually deal with. Um, you know, older age groups, higher um, BMIs, um, then we have meniscal lesions, injuries, the time to surgery and male patients, these seem to have more chances of cartilage injury and um, the severity of the articular cartilage injuries tends to be worse. So just my focus of today's talk is mainly a bi biological update because I'm mainly focused on that side of things but just to quickly give you an overview on what we do when we, when we get a patient with a cartilage or meniscus injury, obviously we study our patient, uh, their age, BMI, the demand, their associated pathologies. Uh, and then we look at the lesion. We look at the depth of the lesion, the location of the lesion, and the surrounding tissue. These are the things which determine what surgery the patient gets or whether he gets surgery at all. And when I talk about associated pathologies, I'm talking about whether the whole limb is malaligned. You can't put a new tire on your uh, bent alloy wheel. It's not going to uh, do anything for your car. The same way if, you're, if your shock observer is damaged, that's your meniscus. Uh, you can't just go and uh, you know do a, put a new tire on. That's also going to get damaged. And then instability. If you haven't put your tire on to your car properly, it's going to roll off. Uh, and that's kind of what we aim at when we look at um, dealing with the entire knee together. So here's here's what we fail to do. Or here's a little bit of what we try to do, being physicians, conservative approaches. And uh, you know all the physicians here will be laughing at us because all we really have is painkillers. We're the easiest people to send to a camp because we just need two or three two or three medicines. Chondroprotective agents like glucosamine, chondroitin. Um, I see so many of you know our patients taking it, so many of my rel relatives taking it. I'm not sure about people here, but they do nothing. Uh, you might as well just take your uh, cod liver oil tablets and hope for the best. They don't do anything at all. Uh, and then we've got these hyaluronic acid injections which came out about uh, 30 years ago. They came and went. Uh, results were very much ambiguous. Um, methyl prednisol injections, I think some of my senior colleagues in the department probably used it very often and now I'm sure they've uh, all stopped using it, especially in the articular joints. But the one thing that has stood the test of time is weight reduction. So now we've got some newer biological agents and again we're tinkering with um, you know, autologous blood from the patient and we basically have something called an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. 
and all we're doing is going and blocking that receptor in the knee joint to try and reduce inflammation. And here in our department, we've been using a certain brand uh, that's been launched in the market for the last three years and patients seem to be doing well up to six months. So as far as I'm concerned, that is the only medical line of things that we have. Doxycycline, even in the department, we have a little bit of an argument whether this works or not. A couple of studies have shown that it works in mice. So uh, we do sometimes put our patients on about two to six weeks of doxycycline after a cartilage uh, surgery. So our surgical options, quick brief summary, we're surgeons, so we like to fix. So if you can fix the lesion, with, with uh, if you have a nice big cartilage lesion and you can fix it, we can fix it with suture anchors or with threads or tapes or with pins. Um, then we have the chondroplasty, which is basically just going there and doing a bit of hair cutting. Uh, just to remove any mechanical symptoms and that general lavage of the joint seems to reduce the cytokine load and they tend to fare better so i would recommend those for good small good for small lesions and short-term results then you've got microfracture and nanofracture something that uh, surgeons use you know a lot but it can be quite damaging and um, it's a cheap option there's nothing extra about it uh, we do it during arthroscopy. It's, it takes about five minutes for us. It's good for small lesions and short-term results, but you're actually damaging that subchondral bone. I told you the whole the whole unit is, um, you know, nu uh, nutrition comes from the subchondral bone. You've gone and put holes in it. So that actually creates a lesion there and you end up with a cyst. Then we have oats, which is that video that you're seeing over there that was done here maybe about uh, two months ago. Um, we just take some cartilage and um, bone from another part of the joint and we put it back where the lesion is and these patients tend to do fairly well so I would recommend these for longer term results. And then we have ACI and MACI, uh, something that we are quite fond of um, where, we, where we take a little bit of cartilage, we biopsy a little bit of cartilage from your knee, send it over to a lab that we know in Pune, take about six weeks, they expand the cells for you and they give it back to us in a gel form and we are able to uh, deliver that into the uh, defect site. Uh, obviously, ACI 40 years ago done in Gothenburg, Sweden, things have progressed. We are now using uh, scaffolds along with those cells and I hope into the future we can omit that biopsy. If we can just take a cell from your skin, a fibroblast, make it an induced pluripotent stem cell and then push it towards a chondrogenic uh, lineage, we can omit that first surgery as well. So the biggest problem with ACI is we have two surgeries, two expenses. Then our final option, uh, OCA, osteochondral allograft. So we are um, you know, fond of um, transplant as well, and if we could get our hands on some good femoral condyles, this is what we would be doing. I think um, we would, the number of uh, OCAs would be fairly high if we actually had our hands on uh, these, implant, these biological implants. And I think robotic knee is probably not the new frontier, but a biological joint is. So what's next? Um, just recently in the market, we've got something called minced autologous cartilage. Uh, they've come out and given us a one-stop solution where you go and shave all that damaged cartilage, take it through the shaver and put it back on the uh, defect site over there. And uh, some preclinical data has suggested that the cartilage and the cells going through the shaver gives it some increased mitogenic activity. Um, the advantage here is it's single stage. It doesn't have to go to the lab. You're not taking a biopsy from anywhere. And something very important with ACI is there's no de-differentiation here. ACI, every time you culture a cell, it becomes less and less like its parent cell. So in this sense, you've taken the patient's own cell and you haven't done any passaging. So the future is cells. Um, something that was quite um, close to my heart is synovium, synovial tissue. I think here in uh, Lakeshore, we've used a lot of bone marrow and adipose. Uh, we haven't done any passaging of synovial tissue. But we've just been sticking some synovium into some of our different repair sites. But really, if you look at this slide, you can see that synovial tissue is the best and most chondrogenic and osteogenic tissue we have in our body. It is, you know, what we like to call the doctor of the knee. So what we do do here is uh, surgery with the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Um, it's a single single stage surgery. We take it from your iliac crest or your tibial tuberosity. We do a little bit of uh, centrifugation and then we put it into the defect site. Um, I'd give it a 5 out of 10. It's probably not something that's very standardized. All of you have different uh, levels of platelets, different levels of stem cells in your bone marrow. So um, as far as I'm concerned, this is what we have right now and this is what we're using right now, but it's definitely not the best. This is something that we worked on in Japan. It's called tissue engineered construct. So here we use the synovial cells. 
And I'm hoping this is something that opens up to us soon. But here we take synovium and just like with cartilage, we expand it and we make it into something over here. You can see that chewing gum like little tissue over there. That's, that's a quite a miraculous structure. You can just stick it onto the cartilage side. It sticks on its own. It doesn't need a clot. It doesn't need any fibrin glue. It just holds on there and you get excellent results. Um, and <clears throat> this has uh, just been uh, through its first RCT. I mean, I've just shown you what, what's been done on uh, five patients. But you can see over here the MRIs. I don't know what Julio sir has to say, but the uh, arthroscopy looks pretty good, good defect fill. And uh, the biopsies, I can say, do give you hyaline cartilage. So I think this is definitely something going into the future that we should be getting. And the RCT of about 75 patients is done. It will be published uh, within the next couple of months. And then we've got biomaterials. We've been playing with these for a while. And you can see over here something called True Fit um, was you know, straight away a disaster. So we are burning our hands. The new, the new kid on the block is Agile C, which is a coral-like structure. And I think this is where we're headed in terms of an, a biomaterial. Uh, and maybe combining that with ACI, you should be able to get, like I said, a chondroaceous unit. Some studies uh, basically showing you that TrueFit actually did fail, but the other two implants, uh, Mayor Region and, um, and the Agile C, seem to have some promise. Now quickly coming on to the meniscus. Um, it's a very unfavorable environment. Uh, biomechanics on a meniscus is, ter is uh, extreme. Uh, it's like your shock observer in your car, so it's constantly taking load. It's very avascular. Uh, there's a lot of synovial fluid moving around it, and there's a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I don't know if any of you have actually dissected a meniscus. It's almost like cartilage. It's very, very stiff structure. So for it to tear, there's a significant amount of force or some kind of talking that happened on that tissue. So going ahead and uh, assuming it will heal or removing it is the most disastrous thing you can do. So I think everyone in the room, as far as from our department is concerned, uh, repairs their menisci. We do not advocate a meniscectomy unless you know, we're really dealing with someone who's heading for a total knee replacement. And we've got a few different types of tears and we have different methods of treating them. I'm not going to go into the details, but these are some of the terms you might hear being used. And finally, we are doing meniscal allograft transplants now. Uh, the only problem is getting the grafts. And again, over here, we have a biological side of things. And my main problem with orthobiologics is we actually don't know what falls under the term orthobiologic. Um, it's just loosely called a biologic substance that's used to improve musculoskeletal healing. And the corporates and big pharma have jumped into this, and they've just been pushing it, because it's something that you don't have to um, explain too much. Patients love hearing that it's from their own body and it's demand driven and minimally regulated. So I think it's something that we have to be very careful about uh, when, you, when you go out and hear terms like PMAC and PRP. So we have two methods that we can use to augment a meniscus repair. You can either augment the surgical site or you can give an isolated injection. What we do here at Lakeshore is usually an augmentation of the surgical repair. So the options that we have are blood derived, stem cell derived, and then now we're coming on to exosomes. So we start off with PRP and ACS, which is uh, the most easily available. They've been around for 20, 30 years. We're not very fond of it in our department. I know other departments around town do use it. Uh, we tend to be using a bit more of the stem cell line of things. That's the bone marrow aspirate concentrate, microfragmented adipose tissue, or synovial, um, or SVF, which is stromal vascular fraction, again, taken from adipose. So again, these, these things are minimally regulated. They aren't um, a, a pure science yet. Uh, they have rushed through the preclinical phase and come to us on the bench side and sometimes you know we, we don't have any other option exosomes are the extracellular vesicles that you have in your cells they're basically strands of mrna and this is also something that we were working on in japan which should be coming but if you can program your cell to say hey i'm not getting older i want to get younger and you give it the the transcription mrna to do that you could start reversing uh, aging you could start reversing uh, senescence in these cells. So just a quick slide about PRP. It's just a bunch of growth factors. If you really ask us, we don't know what's in it. Uh, we know that we're concentrating something that, that's from your body. But if you really get down to the nitty gritty, there's so much variability, there's no standardization, uh, and there's numerous uh, companies driving it. Uh, but the, the sad thing is, we have a lot of clinical literature, which means we're all using something that we're not very sure of. So people have tried to classify PRP. This is just one that I think was a reasonable one, looking at the amount of platelets 
the activated method and the white blood cell count. But I, but I think we should really err on the side of caution. And these are a lot of studies that have shown uh, benefits of PRP, but when you really look at them, they're not looking at objective outcomes. They're not, they're not standardized in the way that they prepare the PRP. Not everyone has a second look arthroscopy. So I really wouldn't advocate much use of PRP. Uh, so I would say that it's just basically uh, level 3 data that seems safe. You haven't heard of anyone dying of a PRP injection. Um, and I don't think we can really make an, a recommendation whether or not it's to be used when you're trying to save a knee joint. So just a quick uh, video from what we do over here. Once we do our meniscus repair, um, we go ahead and do it. We, we switch over to carbon dioxide and we do a dry scoping and we just infiltrate that area with a fibrin clot and bone marrow aspirate. And I'm not saying this is the best thing that we do and we're not on the frontier here, but this is the option that we have. And we do see some nice MRIs. Uh, again, I, would, I will quote Julio, sir, he has seen some of our MRIs and you know, even we are shocked sometimes. But sometimes we're not, sometimes we don't see good repairs. So I can't say that it's always a win situation. Uh, just some quick data um, showing, you know, we've got some good results with BMAC, but I don't think anyone's publishing any negative data against any of these biologics, which I think is something that we need to be very careful about. So basically we have limited data and limited studies. Uh, I would like to see synovial MSCs coming into uh, picture, but the problem is the FDA only approves minimally manipulated therapies. So we are at loss there as well. Some of the options that we have are fibrin clots, bone marrow venting, trephination, and then something that we started doing here is we just cut a little bit of synovium from the suprapatellar pouch and stick it into our meniscus repair and hope that it's doing something uh, cytogenic over there. So the, I think going forward, where we're looking at is PRP is considered most valuable, but I put that in brackets because it's only because we have data, uh, but it's not good data. Um, <clears throat> and I think we're heading towards a situation where we're going to have 3D printing, biomaterials and tissue engineering. So again, we've got all these biomaterials on hand, um, but again, here comes tech. We managed to make that little tissue and we stick it inside a meniscus tear and just look at the kind of repair we have over there at six months. It does fill the defect site quite well um, and meniscus is basically somewhere between bone and cartilage. So if we can make cartilage, we can definitely make meniscus. But it's a complex phenotype, it's not like cartilage. So as the cell has multiple phenotypes in there, um, it's somewhere between a fibroblast and a chondroblast and an osteoblast. So I think these synovial cells seem to be doing a pretty good job over there. And you can see the histology as well, um, figure B over there. Uh, you are seeing some vascularity uh, and in the saffronose staining. Other augments, like I said, we have our fibrin clots, which we used to use quite often. Uh, synovium, platelet-rich fibrin that was popularized by one of our residents over here. Uh, and then we have our PRP. So coming to the future, I found this paper which would seem quite interesting, but basically we're going to start 3D modeling our tear site and creating a patient-specific scaffold that can go into that tear. Uh, I'm not really sure about the practical application. I'm not really sure how easy it's going to be, especially when you have a fluid or a dry scopy. But this could be something that's coming in the future uh, where we don't lose tissue. Every time we do a repair, we are compressing the tissue, losing you know, elasticity, losing the amount of tissue that's separating both your femoral and tibial condyle. So if we can put something in that's patient-specific, uh, that seems to be what everybody wants, patient-specific. So the bottom line is meniscus is an extremely complex structure. Any investigation, any, any of these agents that we use biologically should be investigational agents, both in cartilage and meniscus. Uh, we do try and follow up all our patients. Uh, I do keep arguing with my residents, but you know we do need follow up. Any patient that comes to our department, we try and put them into some form of study so that we can follow them up at some point whenever we think of a, um, a paper. Um, but biomaterials and tissue engineering hopefully will pay, pave the way forward. Thank you. Any questions? While you're waiting for somebody to ask you questions, what about allergenic cells off the shelf? So allergenic cells are great, um, especially if you're going for something uh, like an induced pluripotent cell, an embryonic, embryonal stem cell. They don't have any immunogenic issue, but you now you've opened up something that's also very tumorogenic. So we're not able to use it in clinical studies. They've shown great results preclinically, but we're too scared. You take an MSC from someone else, there is immune, there is some immunogenicity in that MSC because it's already crossed a mesenchymal lineage. Some company in uh, Mumbai is trying to sell. Yeah, cells. there's a company in Mumbai just selling cells. I uh, don't really know what that is, but they give you a little um, vial full of MSCs, allergenic MSCs. Mayo Group with Daniel Saras are using allergenic MSCs. Um, 
tech is manufactured, the theoretically tech will be manufactured using allogenic MSCs. If you can bank a lot of MSCs together and, and culture them, then it will be fairly cheap to provide these treatments. So I think allogenic is the way to go, but in terms of immunogenicity, I think we still have an issue there and we need to err on the side of caution. What about tech? Can we make it on site in our own hospital? So I was hoping you'd ask me, you know, what's the future? What can be done better at Lakeshore? If you really want to get biological here, we need a lab. Um, you know, a GMP certified lab and some scientists together, we can actually do something really wondrous. Uh, you know, this is, these are some really great technologies that are available to us. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of CRISPR, very cheap, uh, very easy to use. Um, out in Osaka, they're using it to modify osteoarthritis. So, yeah, I think definitely tech, to make tech is not expensive at all. It's very, very easy. Uh, how do you exactly, how do they make tech? So basically you take uh, a little biopsy of synovial tissue from the suprapatellar pouch um, and in the RCT it was taken from five patients and they treated 75 patients. In the study that I showed you, each patient was take, uh, made by their own tech. And you basically take the, the synovial tissue and you break it down with collagenase and you just, you just suspend the cells out of that. And you put it into a small dish and you start culturing them in a high density monolith. So basically you're trying to reach a very high density, about 400 cells per um, micro, uh, MM. I can't remember the exact number, but you, you need a very, very high concentration of cells. And a, as these cells sit together in that, in that dish and you keep culturing them, normally we have a nice big 20 centimeter square uh, Petri dish, but in this it's a very small 4 centimeter square uh, Petri dish. And you keep changing your cells, uh, your culture media, the cells start to kind of hold hands and they start to become tissue-like. And then, you, um, and then you start to develop something that looks like a membrane. Um, and then, you know, I think about two weeks, it's mature enough to just circle off and you get this sticky substance that you go and put over there. How is tech made? It was an accident by a lazy lab student who forgot to keep changing the culture media. So, it was a mistake. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, George. Uh, and uh, finally, we come to shoulder. I think we come to three parts of the uh, joints. Unlike in other specialties, we still don't have a separate knee doctor um, and physician. So we guys are starting to each pick up different joints to improve things. And uh, I think we all heard of frozen shoulder. We've been hearing it from the time uh, from as an undergraduate. And I think we all managed it in a lot of crazy ways. A lot of the wrongly diagnosed. And I think even when I started operating on frozen shoulders, I just shaved a little bit and got, it, I think, Apu has taken it a bit further, and there you go, Apu, leave it to you. Uh, morning, uh, seniors and colleagues. Uh, so, from, from something that was an emer emergency to something that was latest to something now that is neither. So, um, the importance of frozen shoulder mostly comes from what we see in the hospital, like a lot of people, a lot of departments refer the shoulder pain. <coughs> and uh, most of the time it is, we think it's frozen shoulder, so is it actually a frozen shoulder? It is actually a disease that is debated right from its name to its optimal treatment and its prognosis. There is no consensus even now among what is, what it is. And <coughs> there is there are papers that are now coming up which suggest what exactly it is, but still there is a controversy. So basically stiff shoulders are divided into a primary idiopathic stiff, which is actually the frozen shoulder. And there is a secondary stiff shoulder, which means that you have some other pathology in the shoulder. When you say earlier this frozen shoulder was actually called, as, there was a, a term called adhesive capsulitis, which is no more use because there is no additions inside the shoulder. So when do you say it's frozen? Uh, when your when your flexion, which means <coughs> this movement, is just above the shoulder level, that is 100 degrees of forward flexion, when you can't externally rotate, and when you can't bring your hand behind, that's when you say, it's called a global restriction of range of motion, or it's a frozen shoulder. It basically has three stages. The first stage is actually called a freezing stage, then there's a frozen and a thawing stage. In between these three stages, it can take anywhere between a year to four years so many times we hear uh, this statement that a frozen shoulder is a self-limiting condition. Yes, it is a self-limiting condition, but 
uh, without intervention, this self-limiting condition may last up to four years. So, what is the freezing stage? It's essentially a stage where there's a lot of inflammation inside the capsule and synovium. So, this is a situation where actually synovium doesn't help. It's an inflamed synovium which causes a lot of pain and there is partial restriction of range of motion. Then it goes on from a freezing to a frozen stage. Essentially, it's this is where the first half of the frozen stage is more pain and the second half is when you have the pain gives away to a lot of stiffness. And uh, essentially what we see is a lot of fibrosis from the inflammation, it changes to fibrosis inside the capsule. And the last stage is called the thawing stage. This is where the shoulders pain starts coming down and then there is gradual resolution of stiffness. So who are susceptible to, who are, who, susceptible to frozen shoulders. So most common cause is an idiopathic cause. But there are two conditions where we see a high incidence of frozen shoulders. So one is diabetes mellitus. So studies say anywhere between 5 to 20 percent incidence of frozen shoulder in diabetics. And then hypothyroid. Especially when uh, uh, hypothyroid, it's somewhere between 3 to 6 percent. Then range of conditions that almost affect everything in the body. So there is smoking, cardiac disease, depression, neck surgery, cardiac surgery, hyperlipidemia. So what about in our hospital scenario, what are the conditions that we should be? So one is breast cancer or most importantly mastectomy. So women between 50 to 60 years undergoing mastectomy who uh, are at major risk for adhesive capsulitis of shoulder. And if, if it is accompanied by a breast reconstruction, the risk is increased. So, uh, what it means is that these people should be, uh, the, these women should be put on a rehabilitation program assuming that they will or they might get adhesive capsulitis. The other thing that makes it difficult and challenging in these people, uh, in these women are that uh, because of the uh, mastectomy and uh, because the lymph nodes are removed, surgery for uh, such cases become difficult. The other surgeries commonly associated with frozen shoulder are cardiac and neck surgery. So when there is uh, yeah. in cardiac surgery, it's most often due to the weakness of the supporting muscles. And in uh, neck, it, uh, both cervical and uh, neck dissection for uh, tumors, it's usually a trapezius dysfunction that starts this process. So what about vaccination? Recently, so everybody's undergone vaccination for COVID and uh, does COVID vaccination cause frozen shoulder? Um, initially, I was also very skeptical. So somebody comes to me with a pain in shoulder after uh, COVID vaccination. I was also uh, hesitant to tell them that, you know, it is the vaccination that causes because we were worried about promoting an anti-vaccination drive with that. But as time moved on, we found that there are people who have got frozen shoulder after vaccination. And this is not just with COVID vaccination. It is, there are papers which have shown that tetanus and influence of vaccines have caused frozen shoulder in the past. So it's uh, called, called uh, shoulder injury related to vaccine administrations. Um, so there are many case reports now coming from all over India where I personally have seen around three patients I think now that uh, post-COVID vaccination have gone into some sort of shoulder pain or shoulder frozen shoulder. Now coming to what exactly happens in frozen shoulder. So it is uh, on this, what we see on the right, uh, the right side is a normal tissue and the left is actually a frozen. So you can see that there is a uh, disturbance in the local collagen translation and there is dense collagen matrix in uh, frozen shoulder and the histology is supposed to be very similar to that of a Dubitrin's contract. <coughs> Macroscopically what happens is the tissue, of the capsule appears thick. The, the main uh, area where the capsule appears thick is around the rotator interval that is the area between the subscapularis and supraspinatus and the, uh, and there is a thickened coracohumeral ligament. So, and it's found that this fibrotic process is not kind of global. It's mostly in the anterior part of the shoulder, not in the posterior part. 
more recently what we have started concentrating on in frozen shoulders this particular ligament called the coracohumeral ligament so this coracohumeral ligament is a very wide thin ligament that encapsulates the whole starts from below the coracoid process encapsulate the whole of the subscapularis muscle and part of the supraspinatus and it goes and attaches to the humerus hence coracohumeral and it's found that this ligament undergoes thickening in frozen shoulder so how is what else uh, what do you usually con confuse frozen shoulder with so there is there is a whole range of secondary stiffnesses that can be confused with frozen shoulder so it can be trauma infection inflammatory disorders and usually the differential diagnosis is usually a uh, calcific tendonitis um uh, pain rotator cuff tear a glenohumeral instability all these things can eventually lead to a stiff shoulder so it is important to differentiate a primary frozen shoulder from all these before you start treatment because the treatment differs according to your diagnosis so then coming to just frozen shoulder per se how do you start treat you essentially it's a clinical diagnosis where you see a global restriction which is no antecedent incidents um maybe the patient may be diabetic or hypothyroid but if you do end up taking an mri for these you find that there is a thickened coracohumeral ligament there is also a uh, obliteration of the axillary pouch so you find thickening of capsule in these areas so you yeah, it's easier when this is identified early and you have to know what intervention can you do so going through literature i mean other than what we do i was just going through literature and found that interestingly there are papers that even advise supervised neglect and they say that supervised neglect might be better than everything but then when you go into the paper when you start reading the details it's you realize that supervised neglect works when you get the patient in your thawing stage so most of these uh, patients were actually um, one or two years into their disease so in thawing stage naturally they start improving but it's um uh, it's not easy to tell somebody that you have to suffer this for 2 years before you get better the other thing that really helps is physiotherapy um it's supposed among the conservative management other than your painkillers and all that physio is shown to have the most most effect on increasing rom and functional outcomes but the thing with physiotherapy is um it has to be supervised um the patient has to be told or we have to see them at least once a week see that things they are doing things the way it is supposed to be then when you when you come to the next step it is whether do you inject so it's an inflammatory process naturally there is a question of do you reduce inflammation by injecting steroids into the shoulder so over a lot of studies the controversy of what to inject whether do you inject a local anesthetic do you inject a steroid do you go in the joint or out of the joint is it better when it's imaged or is it wet and do you give multiple injections or do you give a single injection so right now the consensus would be that a steroid is better than local anesthetic um an intraarticular injection is better because the inflammation is mostly inside the joint image that right there are recent studies which say that an imaged or ultrasound guided injection into the coracohumeral ligament is now the treatment of choice and single injection is shown to have as much effect as multiple injections so there's no point in going on injecting hoping that the patient will get better so after all your conservative management if things don't work what are the next what what can you do so when it comes to interventions What, what common what is commonly done everywhere is a manipulation under general anesthesia so i personally don't do a lot of these um there might be some bias because we are surgeons but um manipulation under general anesthesia is shown to be useful usually in the third stage but the problem with manipulation is that if you do it in the earlier stages mm -hmm. the inflammatory response might, might actually increase so patient's pain might increase and they might refuse to do physio post manipulation which will end up where they'll end up in the same situation again uh and the problem with manipulation is that uh, there are 
Several complications reported including fractures, dislocations, rarely brachial plexus injuries post manipulation. The other choice from uh, then what else can we do? So we do do surgeries for, uh, for frozen shoulder. It is usually after a trial of uh, conservative management usually. In patients who are refractory to conservative management who are severely stiff we can do a arthroscopic release and essentially what we release is in this picture what you see the area the thoracohumeral ligament and the rotator interval above it and all the all this tissue in the front which is the capsule so i'll end the talk with a small video of a patient that we did recently so this is a nurse working in a neonatal ICU in New Zealand who's been undergoing physiotherapy for the last um, six months in New Zealand. So essentially you can see there's a lot of synovitis inside the shoulder where the shaver is and what we are shaving is essentially the coracohumeral ligament and the rotator interval. The structure seen above the shaver is actually the inflamed biceps. So in her we did release the rotator interval, release the anterior capsule and uh, because the biceps was inflamed, we did a biceps tenodesis. Thank you. Thanks, Apu. I think we're perfectly on time, 9.30. Any, any questions? So any more queries? Any comments? There you okay. So once the chairman of today's session, uh, Dr. Jacob Burgess, has concluded the meeting, I feel it's we are scheduled and on time for the first meeting which started about five to six years back. Dr. Harun has been the backbone for having done this. And we appreciate him. We are coming to the end of the year. That is December is finishing and the new year 2023 is about to start. We have a lovely uh, talk from the three uh, speakers on the dais. Dr. Joe Sparknashiri we wouldn't be surprised if he does greater things because his experience has been vast. So I wouldn't go into him. Then we have two youngsters, Jacob and Apu. They have been doing meritorious work. Their publications have been coming out in peer reviewed journals. But I should say that all work and no play makes the act a dull boy. Today evening, our Jacob is performing with a hat in Bangalore where he's got a band of his own. So you must understand that it is not only orthopedics that keeps him going, but also the music behind him. And I must also tell you about Appu. He's the only doctor in Kerala who has run 110 kilometers non-stop. So these are fabulous records from the Department of Orthopedics. We have many specialties. Our previous uh, person who led this hospital for many years was Dr. Nasir Jandi. Nobody can forget him. And then now there is Jose and our new director, Jacob Burgess. To conclude, let me wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy